So I was telling you this story, this wonderful story about the golden hour and why we are motivated by this. And not much has changed since the Civil War about what we do between the time we, uh, a medic or a first responder comes to a patient who has been, suffered a major trauma and it has to be evacuated. We've done a great job in the evacuation protocol. So not, uh, this is unrelated to the talk I'm about to give, but we have a, a study that's, on, that's just initiating where we're beginning to ask these individuals in a far forward position on the battlefield or on the highways, the EMTs, what do they need? What would they like to know? What kind of information, physiologic data now, they would like to convey to an internist, the person who is at the door when the gurney comes in? We're not getting good feedback. <laughs> so. Anyway, so, so I have to disclose to you this business about me being involved in a company. It's a company I formed, founded back in 1985. Company sells chips. Um, please buy chips. Um, we'll make more, as Jay Leno used to say. Um, but I direct a center at Clemson that's a multi-faculty center focused on nano and bio in human health. So uh, let me acknowledge some of the work of, that I'll talk about today. Um, Professor Ishihara is a collaborator from Japan, Tokyo University, and um, uh, his, his major contribution has been the synthesis of uh, phosphorylcholine derivative that we use in our hydrogels. Um, Nolan works in the area of wound healing and um, constructing hydrogels that are sensitive to the wound environment, responding to the chemistry of the wound, releasing agents into the wound, particularly to address chronic wounds. And as we age, this is going to be one of our problems, chronic wounds. Christian works on the implantable device that I'll talk about, and Coyote works on the carbon nanotube enzyme conjugates, which I'll mention briefly. Ah, Fuzan. He's, he happens to be in this particular image. There are six graduate students. Fuzan is an undergraduate. He's the, he just happened to be there on that day. He <laughs> he's our trusted gopher. Um, so the motivation is here. Trauma, it turns out, is one of the leading causes of death amongst the young. That's young. Persons who are 50 years and younger. That's young, okay? Because as you know, we have a gradually aging pop. That's young. I know you, <laughs> you're counted amongst the young. I am out of the woods, fortunately. Um, but it's the leading cause of death among individuals in this age group. And of course, the leading source of their demise are usually accidents, fall or trauma on the highway. It's the highest contributor to death within the first 24 hours. No other disease, I know you don't usually associate trauma with a disease, but let's just take that for what it means, has this kind of sh very short between incident and death. Cancer? No. Heart disease? No. 68% of battlefield deaths are associated with trauma, and the trauma is a, uh, a demise is due to, to bleeding. So these are, the, these are the statistics. Now, we've known this for a while. Percentage of deaths arising from peripheral wounds within the first 24 hours after the first 24 hours. So highway fatalities and battlefield fatalities all are associated with bleeding as a result of the trauma. The impact is found here. Work years lost, let's say compared to cancer and heart disease. More work years are lost due to trauma than these two major killers, cancer and heart disease. And the reason is it affects the young. Trauma affects the young. The cost to our nation, $406 billion. And hemorrhage is judged to be the number one preventable cause of death in, co in combat. Now, the projectile will cause the damage, but it's the bleeding that causes the death. What do we do? The current standard of care is we look at vital signs. Just like in the First World War, we look at vital signs. Heart rate. If the heart rate is above 100 beats per minute, the patient's in tachycardia. And of course, the unusual thing is that tachycardia only shows up in about 60% of so-called 
hypotensive patients, patients whose blood pressure has fallen below normal. So tachycardia is not a good surrogate for a patient's prognosis, but we use it. It has no correlation with oxygen delivery, which is the big problem you have. If you're bleeding, blood is supposed to go, uh, physiology 101, blood goes around and around and it carries oxygen, okay? If it's not doing that, you're going to die. So what is tachycardia having to do with oxygen delivery? Nothing. Blood pressure. We measure the blood pressure. Turns out blood pressure is a very late indicator of the shock. Shock is when the blood pressure falls to below 40 millimeters of mercury. Here's some very old data. Oxygen delivery versus mean arterial pressure. What I want to show you is that mean arterial pressure as an indicator is a very poor correlator with outcomes. This is your mean arterial pressure as you sit, unless you have high blood pressure. Most of us are within this window, and most of us have oxygen delivery within this window. So most of us sitting in this room are within this sweet spot. These black spots are the oxygen delivery and mean arterial pressures for patients who were admitted into trauma centers. The vital sign is not correlating with outcomes. Here is high bl uh, blood pressure, oxygen delivery, no correlation between heart rate and oxygen delivery. That's the tachycardia issue. No correlation between how hot fast your heart is beating and the amount of oxygen that's being delivered to your tissue. You don't need to have a PhD in statistics to see that there's no correlation there. This is where your current sweet spot is for oxygen delivery and heart rate, as you sit right now. It's just a very narrow window for all of us. So we believe there's an opportunity to develop some alternative technologies. What can we do that are adjuncts to vital signs? How can we supplement the existing measures that are used by first responders? Well, it turns out that lactate is one of those indicators of physiologic stress. Well, you know this because each time you exercise, you get the lactic acid burn. I haven't felt it in a while, I must admit. My wife keeps showing me the treadmill, but I don't see it. <laughs> Lactate is one of those molecules that accumulates under aerobic conditions, anaerobic conditions, sorry, because poor oxygen delivery is occurring in the tissues. If the blood is not delivering oxygen to the tissues, it consumes whatever glucose or glycogen stores are available, and it accumulates lactate. So we've known for a while that patients who can have normalized lactates within 24 hours have a good survival rate. Within 24 to 48 hours, 75% of those patients would survive. And if you could normalize within 48 hours, 13% could survive. After that, of course, very low survival rates. So tracking lactate and trying to emphasize eulactemia, which is return to normal lactate levels, seems to be a very important indicator for survival. So glycema, uh, uh, sugar, blood sugar is also an important indicator. Patients who are hypoglycemic with low blood, sugar, low, low blood oxygen have excess mortality. That is, they die more often. And so most emergency response departments now would administer insulin, even to the non-diabetic, as a way to prevent what is known as insulin resistance and to reduce mortality. This, in fact, was one of those few technologies that burst onto the scene very quickly and was adopted very quickly. Um, medical practice, as you know, is slow to adopt new things, but that was one of those that was very rapidly adopted. Here is the challenge. 
When the patient is admitted to the trauma center or to the ER, blood may be drawn if it's available and sent to, for analysis to the MDX, the molecular diagnostics lab. And sampling, transport, analysis, anything from 40 minutes to four hours before the data comes back. So if we're gonna use lactate as an indicator, we have this long delay time before we know what the results are. So we think one of the things we might wanna do is develop a microsystem that we could minimally invasive implant at the site where we encounter the, the patient by the first responder, start to track the lactate levels and be able to deliver that data to the internist at the hospital system, at the ER or at the first uh, hospital that the patient is uh, delivered to. So we started off with looking at transducers and we built some discrete devices and of course we want to be able to build an ASIC that looks like this type of device that, um, that is now used um, to simply uh, monitor or track or provide a repository of information, an RFID type device. So our first designs look like this. We said, okay, we'll build a discrete device. The discrete device will have the electronics, a dual potentiostat. We'll talk about what potentiostats are, or Pam will correct us. And, um, and some electronics and some communications devices. And the transducer will be distal from the electronics because we could tolerate some amount of foreign body response around the electronics, but not around the transducer. Foreign body response, I said. Yes. So every new material that's implanted into the body provokes a foreign body response. The consequence of which is eventual encapsulation by a fibrous avascular mat of collagen through which nothing moves. And so devices of this type, transducers of this type, rapidly lose their ability to function because the analyte of interest, the thing we want to measure, the glucose or the lactate or some other small molecule, succinate for example, that no longer has access because of the capsule that's formed. Now if you think you don't know this response, you do. Many of you have wounds from when you played baseball or soccer or cricket and I have broken lips and knees and what have you. And the result is a scar. And you know the scar that you had from the elbows you've bruised. And that scar is largely avascular and it's collagenous. It's mostly just scar tissue. That's what forms around our implant devices. So the notion is separate the electronics from the functional analytical brain of the device and move towards an ASIC where the, the analytical chemistry is done in one region of the device. And we want to address the golden hour. So the analytes we want to be able to measure are glucose. Why glucose? Because of the hyperglycemic connection to insulin resistance, not because of diabetes, but because when you bleed, you are unable to meta metabolize glucose readily. Lactate, because that accumulates when you bleed. And of course, acidosis, pH, simple measure, and temperature, because when you bleed, your core body temperature falls. So here is why we think that's important. Here are examples of lactate levels against some baseline with some high, and we're going to make some hypothesis around this. We're going to take three stat measures. Stat means now. Patient comes through the door, we draw blood, stat sends it to the MDX, they make an analysis, we get it back for the chart. Well, these two measures look that they're like they're quite similar. But the time course of those two measures might be quite different. In the first case, that patient may, may sustain high lactate levels for a long period of time and so be a non-survivor. Whereas this patient might in fact return to eulactemia and survive with maybe some dysfunction syndrome, but they survive. And certainly this patient 
may already be on the way down in terms of returning to a normal lactate level. Our hypothesis is that if we can get this kind of temporal data, we can deliver more than just stat. We can deliver continual. And the integral under the curve might be more important than the actual value. That is, what's the patient's exposure history? How long have they been bleeding? How long has their lactate level been high? That might be more important for the prognosis than just the stat value. So that's our hypothesis. And we've been trying to test this now for the last eight years. So at the point of injury, when the first responder encounters the, the subject, the patient, can we initiate continual monitoring of these indicators? Lactate, glucose, pH, temperature. Can that system be indwelling and be functional for four to six weeks? Why do I say four to six weeks? Well, I just told you about the golden hour. So we only really need it for an hour. But you know how technology is. If we've got it for an hour, we want it for two. So we anticipate that um, if we were able to ever be able to succeed in doing this between the site of injury on the highway and let's say the hospital, the internist will say, why don't we just leave it in and track the patient while they're in the intensive care unit, right? So they'll be likely in the intensive care unit for anything up to four to six weeks. By the way, you remember the Virginia sniper? Yes, I know you lived through it. So one of the, one of the victims was admitted to the Virginia uh, Commonwealth University Trauma Center. The gentleman was shot in the abdomen. And um, he survived. I think he was one of the only one of the sniper's victims to have survived. And um, I don't know all the details, but um, I was on the faculty at the time, and the, the director of that trauma center has a much different view of handling resuscitation than at most traditional trauma centers. And I think that's what gave this patient the, um, the, the, the ability to survive. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But we want fast response with a relatively high update rate, but you know, fast in biological sense, not in a IT sense. You know, when electrical engineers talk about fast, th this is a totally different game space when you think about physiologic responses. You know, for example, over-the-counter glucose test, big bucks. Over-the-counter cholesterol test, no bucks. Why? Your cholesterol levels don't change that dramatically, but your glucose levels do. You, take, you eat a bolus of food in the morning, after an hour your blood sugar escalates. Your glucose level, you can eat as much fat as you want. The induction period is about three months. So no opportunity for a, no business case for an over-the-counter cholesterol test. You need to just go and take your, your statins. Um, so I take statins and I eat as much meat as I could possibly eat. Uh, <laughs> so minimum need for signal amplification, inexpensive fabrication should be compatible with CMOS technology. So we take advantage of all that we've done with CMOS so that we could deliver this analytical device into the body. Well, are we the only ones thinking of this? No, there are lots of examples out there. Um, here is a camera. Here is in fact an externally um, supported device. Uh, with a sensor that's indwelling behind the eye of this fish. Um, here is a, an alcohol sensor um, that, that measures alcohol in, in, the, um, in the body cavity. Our concept is developed for now um, a discrete device that will allow for the analytical chemistry, the glucose, the lactate. Um, potassium is st stuck in there. Um, oxygen levels, pH, and temperature and to power this externally using um, induction and to set up the communications between the receiving device and the um, powering device, allowing us to collect the packets of data and display in some meaningful way these indicators. But the, the principal concern is to be able to collect the data during the transit of the patient. 
and to inform and supplement what the physicians are using in terms of vital signs. So here is what that looks like in, in sort of schematic pure thought. We're working with the transducers now and developing the chemistries and associated biochemistries for the detection of these multiple analytes. Putting that on some sort of chip substrate, integrating it with the potentiostats, the A to D, the communications devices, trying to design an antenna that will receive and transmit and address these big global problems. Because when the feasibility study is done, it turns out that the electronics is not the, the slow step. The slow step is the biology. And by slow step, I mean slow step towards commercialization or development. The biomaterials interface. How do you design a sensor so that once it's indwelling, can survive the insult of the foreign body response? And how to enable the associated electronics, the things that go beyond more. So in our research, we want these low interfacial impedance devices with fast ion transport, host and secure biomolecules, and be in vivo compatible. So we're asking a material, much like Professor here does, asking the material to have lots of functions and be implantable and allow us to measure these analytes and then report this wirelessly. So we've been talking about electroconductive gels as one of the ways in which we might address this bio-a-bio -bio interface, the interface between the biology and the device. So here's what they look like. So this is where the chemistry comes in. So for my double E students, I apologize, but those little C's are carbons and the little O's are oxygen. <laughs> um, OK, so this is. A, a, a schematic of a polymer. Polymers have long chains and they've got sort of dangly chemistries hanging off. And part of our responsibility is to ask, how do we engineer these materials so that they have particular functions? Now, we've just come through an era where if you wanted an aorta replaced, it was going to be replaced with Teflon. If you wanted a, a trachea replaced, it's going to be replaced with Dacron. If you want a heart valve, a polyester. What do these materials all sound like? Clothing. It's all industrial materials. Most of biomedical engineering, up until this professor started, <laughs> um, looked at industrial materials. We looked at what was available in large scale, and we tried to apply those to problems in, in human health. That era, fortunately, is coming to an end. We are now beginning to think about how to design specific materials for the specific tasks in the body. Thanks to the Whitaker Foundation, they've made biomedical engineering a real discipline and have brought some of the best minds to bear. And so you're seeing this sea change in attitudes, both in industry and in academy, about how to design materials. So now, so we are taking a small crack at it, OK? Very modest. We're going to borrow some chemistries from, we're going to borrow some chemistries from the biology. This is phosphorylcholine. This is where, through this single molecule, my collaboration with Professor Ishihara occurs. So Professor Ishihara, took this zwitterionic head group, phosphate and ammonium, from the head group of the outer leaflet of cells, living cells, red blood cells, other cells have this chemistry. We took that chemistry and we said, can we synthesize synthetic materials with this biology, biological chemistry? Why? Because we want to mimic the chemistry of the human body. So therein lies one principle, biomimicry. Can we emulate what the body does in the synthesis of synthetic materials? 
We know that this material here, polyethylene glycol, is a great mitigator of protein adsorption. The literature is rich in this as an example. So we include it. And we have some other um, molecules here that we can do post-synthesis, we can do reactions. That is, after we've synthesized the polymer, we can modify it. And we can also use cross-linkers to hold it together. Now, cross-linkers are important because the number of cross-linkers you include in a polymer determines its mechanical properties to a first order, right? Some of you will say, no, Professor, there's more to it than that, but agreed, to a first approximation. So that's the highly hydrophilic part. It looks like a contact lens. And this, of course, is the one-dimensional conductor polyparole. And we make copolymers of this polyparole with this butyric acid as the side group. Why butyric acid? Because carboxylates seem to be more common in the biology than extreme acids like sulfonates. So polyparole can oxidize and reduce, and it can have high conductivity. So we make these composite materials. And that's where the chemistry of the phosphorylcholine comes from. It comes from the outer leaflet of a cell membrane. So how do we make these materials? We start off with a monomer cocktail. I like to use the word cocktail because my graduate students get impressed with that. You know, they say, cocktail professor, let's make a cocktail. Um, all the monomer are brought together and mixed, sort of a one-pot chemistry, but the ratios are controlled. Notice in the previous slide, I didn't tell you what the percentages were. I didn't. Because that the percentage ratios, the ratios amongst them, is sort of the exploratory space. It's trying to find out exactly how much phosphorylcholine should I really include if I want to emulate a red blood cell. How much? I don't know. I couldn't a priori say. So you have to experiment. Then we make these hydrogels, they're UV cross-linkable and they're photodefinable. We can spin them on, just like you would do a photoresist. You, could, you can pattern it, you can use a mask on it, you can make different kinds of geometries. You can spin them onto electrodes. If you spin them onto electrodes, then you can do electropolymerization of oxidizable molecules. And you could deposit those other molecules within. So here's how we do that. We could do it oxidatively. So here I've just grown polyparole, the black one, inside of the gray one. And we could do it electrochemically as well, on an electrode. Now, it turns out that this is quite wonderful because we could make copolymers of this parole and the parole butyric acid make these kinds of copolymers, provide counter anions that keep them electron neutral, and we could do that all within the hydrogel. So the hydrogel, the contact lens, is like a test tube where we're doing another reaction, and one polymer is forming inside of the other. But it's interesting to note that polyparole is also reactive at this three position. And when we make this parole butyric acid, we're essentially blocking this three position. But the free monomer can also lead to cross links, side chains, etc. So polyparole is not generally a linear polymer. It's a somewhat cross-linked network. So we are forming one network inside of another. And those are called interpenetrating networks. Why is this important? Well, we can form this sort of network in the presence of, here I'm showing polystyrene sulfonic acid, and we could do the kind of ion exchange where we oxidize and reduce the polymer, bring in and out other kinds of ions. And chemical engineers love to do that sort of thing and study their transport numbers. Okay. So with my Student Shubra and my collaborator, Professor Zoika, at uh, West Virginia, we, um, we, we wanted to ask the question about the role of the cross-link density. That's this, the cross-linker. We wanted to ask this question, 
how much of the cross-linker is necessary for us to begin to support biocompatibility. So we explored the cross-linker space. We made these little disks, cast the hydrogel into molds, make these little disks, put them into culture dishes, and then culture cells on them. And the cells will grow on these little disks. But what we did that's unusual is we did the following. After the cells had grown on the dish for some period of time, we picked up the little disc and moved it to a new well and gave it fresh media. <coughs> what does that mean? Only the cells that were attached to the gel would move. So only the cells that were attached would move. We gave it fresh media and then we counted how many cells were left behind. Then we move it again, and then we do something known as an MTT assay. It looks at the biological activity of the cells, how viable they are. That's the animated version. My students love to do this sort of thing. So we do this for cells in culture for four days, 12 days, 16 days. I'll cut to the chase. And then we measure the number of cells. OK, the slide is busy. Slide is busy. Don't worry about it. We looked at the morphology of the cells. What did we learn? We learned that for very low cross-linked densities, like 1%, the cells, in fact, develop these attachment processes. That is, they became spindle-like in their morphology, indicating that they were attaching to the gel. Whereas at high cross-link densities, they did not. We were surprised. Why were we surprised? Because there is a nexus out there, there is a belief system out there that stiffer things support cell growth and proliferation versus soft things. So we turned this all on its head and we had to really think about this very carefully. So we went and we did the nano indentation elastic modulus measurement. And this just shows the technique of using a nano indenter on a surface, much like an AFM probe tip, and using um, the Hertz model, you could back out the elastic modulus from the force displacement curve. So we looked at the modulus and we asked, what's going on with this material? As we change the mole percent of the cross linker, the, the material behave in a predictable way. It's glass transition temperature. It's TG, shown in blue, went down monotonically. That's predictable. The theory supports it, and the evidence supports it. However, the hydration level, the bulk water, was about constant. Bulk water. What's bulk water? If you took your contact lens, your plastic contact lens, and you, f you fail to close the cap, next morning, the bulk water is gone, and you've got a piece of brittle plastic. That's the bulk water. So you see, I didn't wear my contacts because that probably happened. Um, it happened too often, so I just use my regular glasses. Um, the green line here shows the bound water. Bound water is a little bit different. Bound water is water that can only be released from the material with some persuasion. And you have to do a DSC experiment to get the temperature up well above the boiling point to get this water off. Bottom line, this curve. Bottom line is this curve. Here is the Young's modulus measured by nanoindentation EFM. The Young's modulus is shown in blue. The Young mo Young's modulus goes up predictably with increasing cross-link density. Things should get stiffer as you make them tighter, right? It does. But the cell viability goes down. That was not so clear. This is the MTT assay of cell viability. That went down. But look at now in red the free to bound water ratio. The ratio between the free water and the bound water tracks exactly the modulus. And it tracks exactly in the opposite the cell viability. Now, you're probably asking, well, what, what is all the connection here? 
Freezer-bound water has to do with protein adsorption. Cells, you see, the cells are doing what, are, what is called adaptive proliferation. The cells are, in fact, terraforming. Who is a Star Trek fan here? Okay, the cells are excreting proteins that adsorb onto the surface, denature on the surface, and then they become attached. They can do that on surfaces where the free to bound water ratio is the lowest. Because the proteins now have opportunity to hydrogen bond with the material because the free water content is low. So that's the conclusion, the free to water content is, is low. So with my colleague, Professor Ishihara, we asked now about the phosphorylcholine component. We said, well, how much phosphorylcholine should we include in this material? And PEG. So here is this 3D graph of PEG, polyethylene glycol, 0 to 0.5 mole percent, and MPC, the phosphorylcholine, 0 to 10 mole percent. So I just want to walk you through two parts of this curve. This front edge and this back plane. On this back plane, we're looking at zero mole percent of polyethylene glycol. Zero mole percent of polyethylene glycol, but we're increasing the MPC content. You notice if we just go from dark blue to light blue, not a lot of hydration difference. MPC is not a particularly good hydrator. Why is this important? There's another theory out there that says one of the reasons why cells don't foul each other is because they've got this wonderful zwitterionic phosphorylcholine on the outside that is fully hydrated and it loves water. And so two cells will collide and they will say thank you very much and separate and they will not foul each other. Well, it turns out that phosphorylcholine is not such a great hydrator. Polyethylene glycol, on the other hand, is a phenomenal hydrator the hydration value goes up considerably for zero mole percent and we looked at protein adsorption because this is the signature event. If proteins can adsorb onto your surface and denature on that surface, then that triggers the inflammatory response. Which proteins? The ECM proteins, the proteins in the extracellular matrix. What are they? Fibronectin, collagen, laminin. So we labeled these proteins with fluorescent probes and we stuck our material into solutions containing these proteins. We wait a while and we ask, how much protein was adsorbed? We then scan and measure the fluorescence. Bottom line, this is 72 hours of immersion. That's 120 hours of immersion. And I was telling you about this temporal response. A lot of protein could adsorb. Yeah, there are some subtle differences, whether it's it's collagen or laminin or fibronectin, but quite a bit of protein would adsorb within the first 72 hours of immersion. But after 120 hours, very little protein adsorption. So clearly, something in time is important. And the long story short, we did a lot of analysis. The, these functional groups that we have put into the polymer are in fact blooming to the surface. They're migrating to the surface. And George Whitesides had shown this in his polyethylene work, his plasma-treated polyethylene work. I think Bob Cohen probably had done some of that kind of work too. That in fact, polar groups would turn in toward from the air, but would turn out when they're in contact with water. So if you have a polymer, its interface is dynamic. So if you have a polymeric implant, you're dealing with a dynamic um, molecular interface. Okay, so we started to do these electropolymerization reactions, which I've shown you before. And here is my undergraduate student who um, has just been admitted to MUSC. Um, but this is his photo when he just completed the, the Iron Man. Why do you want to do this? I don't know. But Iron Man run in Florida. He's the youngest to have ever completed this 36 hour um, ordeal. Um, it's a bike ride, a swim, and a, and a, and a couple super um, um, 
running events. And uh, the two days after he came to the lab, he's just, just like this. But uh, here he is having done that. His challenge was, let's make these hydrogels electroconductive by oxidative polymerization. Let's not use electrochemical technique, let's use an oxidant. And here is his procedure, he uses peroxysulfate. Um, here, ammonium per, um, peroxysulfate or persulfate, makes a hydrogel microsphere, normally highly swollen, to become black with the polyparole. So here is the, poly, here is the polyparole that's been partitioned into the sphere. Here is, or rather, the parole monomer. Then he polymerizes it, different lengths of time. He was able to dissect them and show that, in fact, the polymerization occurs throughout the material. More important than that, he was able to do this kind of um, um, mechanics measurement where he would measure the coefficient of restitution by simply taking these spheres and dropping them from a fixed point to the surf a rigid surface, having them bounce back and measure the height of the bounce. We wanted to be able to measure the, um, the elastic modulus in a traditional way, but you can't hold these things in an instron because they tear. So, the coefficient of restitution is the gateway to the elastic modulus. So, interestingly enough, that's what he did. And he was able to measure these coefficient of restitution measurements. And if you notice here, here is the hydrogel with a coefficient of restitution of 0 0.76. 0 0.75, interestingly enough, for those of you who like billiards, is what a cue ball against the leather tip of a cue stick would give you, 0.75. Of course, the new fancy phenolic resins give you 0.87 or so. But in the good old days, when I was a kid, it was a leather tip, right? And um, so these materials have similar coefficient of restitution. But you could use that coefficient of restitution along with the yield stress to calculate the, uh, the elastic modulus. So here's what he found. I want to cut to the chase. Here's polyaniline in the hydrogel. Polyaniline in the hydrogel. The modulus is less than the modulus with the monomer. Same is true for polyparole. But polyparole is significantly reduced in its modulus compared to with the monomer, just parole monomer. So what we were discovering is that we could make these complexes, and I don't have that slide, which shows that when you make this interpenetrating network of one polymer inside the next, you're really making the elastic modulus um, uh, considerably altered. In this case, the elastic modulus is being reduced. So at my postdoc, we ask about the cell culture work. How do these things grow, support cell culture? We would deposit these onto gold electrodes. Um, you can see a hydrogel barrier here. And we will do the electropolymerization within these cell culture wells. So that is an electro active composite. We would culture cells like PC12 or RMS13, and we ask about the growth of these cells. In purple here, Clemson purple, shows the seeding level of cells on day zero. And in red, the cell numbers after day four. So these are cell density numbers, and these are the different constructs. Here is gold. Gold is a biocompatible material. You can make an implant out of gold. Some people love to do it with denture work. Here is a gold electrode coated with just the gel. Here is a gold electrode coated with pure polyparole, poly, polystyrene sulfonate. And here is gold with our hydrogel composite of polyparole. Look at the difference. Immediately you see that cell growth numbers exceed the seeding level. The cells are rapidly proliferating. They had to double to, 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 to get to that number. And that was true for both RMS13, which are fibroblasts, and PC12, which are neuronal cells. So two different cell types gave us this response. So I told, turned to the student and I said, the postdoc, and I said, well, we need to repeat these kinds of experiments, and we need to show what the effect of the polyparole content would be. So here's our gold electrode, our gold with gel, and polyparoles of different amount, different amounts of polyparole. Cell density, that's the seeding number here. 
and you can see we're going through a turning point. Here is pure polyparole. Pure polyparole is just as biocompatible as gold. No news, Bob Langer had showed this. Polyparole is just as biocompatible as gold. But polyparole hydrogel supports much more aggressive growth and proliferation of cells. We're still trying to find out why. We think it has to do with the network inside the network and the stiffness, which is why we went down that road of looking at stiffness, because we believe the elastic modulus is what's impacting this growth and proliferation. Final observation about these films. They are asymmetric. Here is our gold electrode cast with a hydrogel, and then we're electropolymerizing polyparole inside of the hydrogel. The film is more dense at the interface between the electrode than at the interface between the solution. So this is quite an accidental good thing, we thought, because it means that this part of the material is rich in the hydrogel chemistry, and this part of the material is rich in the polyparole chemistry. So we made this asymmetric structure. We use polyparole to guide the deposition of enzymes. So what I'm showing here is the application of 0 volts to 800 millivolts and to do polymerization of parole in the presence of an enzyme. And that traps the enzyme. So that's one of the methods we use for locating enzyme activity onto micro and nano features. It means that we could deposit electrodes in specific spaces. The other thing we're doing is making these carbon nanotube enzyme conjugates. So this is the work of um, Coyote. He is mixing carbon nanotubes, bucky tubes with enzymes, sonicating them at 23 kilohertz, doing the centrifugation, separating and isolating the tubes that have formed conjugates with the enzyme. Why? Because we want to put the nanotubes within tunneling distance of the cofactors of these enzymes. We're depositing these onto electrodes. So, Elizabeth, this is the protocol. <laughs> a lot of steps involved. Let me back up a little bit here. A lot of steps involved. Here is a microfabricated device. The critical features here are on the order of uh, 20 microns. They're not really small devices. The critical feature size here is about 20 microns. Um, we're going to clean this device in a plasma unit, bring up the OH groups on the silicon carbide, deposit silanes, do a cathodic cleaning of the silanes of the electrode, um, and then we're going to seed a very thin layer of polyparole. Now, we're going to put down a seeding layer. Now, those of you who are in microfabrication know what seeding layers are. So when I talk, talk to my, my chemies about seeding layers, they just glaze over. Here, we're putting down a very a flash, really, of this electrodeposited polymer. Why were we doing this? It's very adherent. It's a good adhesion promoter. Moreover, it's a very thin organic layer to, on which we could do subsequent chemistry. So we discovered this quite by accident. Quite by accident. Hydrogels, as you know, are soft, mushy materials that swell and deswell and they don't attach to anything very well. Has anyone ever pulled pull, pull, pull apart at Pampers? Uh, you don't have kids, right? So just whenever you have kids, take a Pampers, pull it apart, and you'll see the gel, super absorbent gel in there. That's this material. It doesn't like to attach to anything. That's why it's kept between two sheets. Um, we wanted to do some chemistries to attach the gel, so we put very thin layers of polyparole down. But we discovered that this seeding layer was very important to the subsequent growth of another polyparole layer. It affected its kinetics, it affected the quality of the film, and we could use that to direct the deposition of enzymes. So we can create an enzyme-rich layer on top of a seeding layer, on top of a device that had been cleaned and activated with an, with an organosilane. Well, we can do that with Molecules like this, this is ferrocene monocarboxylic acid. We can trap that ferrocene monocarboxylic acid with an enzyme. Why do we want to do that? Because small molecules like ferrocene monocarboxylic acid are excellent mediators. They can replace oxygen. Then 
We can also make our carbon nanotube composites. I'll go through this step again. Ah, there it is. Carbon nanotube conjugate. That is a nanotube that's been wrapped with an enzyme. And we could deposit it onto the electrode. That's what it looks like. It's not pretty. But we can do ampiometry on this. And we can evaluate then the relative merits of the nanotube type biosensor, the mediator type biosensor, and the generation one hydrogen peroxide type biosensor. There are three types of biosensors we could evaluate. And here's what we found. It's disappointment, okay? So bear with me. It's disappointing. So here's our generation two type device that uses a mediator. Good current, nice linear dynamic range, good current behavior. Here's our generation one type device in red. Generation one type device, no mediator. It's just generating peroxide and we're measuring it. For the electrochemist, bear with me. But this generation three type device, this device with the single walled carbon nanotubes, was supposed to be a super performer. We were expecting it to be up here. Significant improvements in the KCAT, in the exchange current density, in all the bioelectronic features. It was quite disappointing when we found that it operated no different than a generation one. So clearly we have to do our homework. We have work to do. Um, We've begun to deposit these into hydrogels and evaluate them. I'll just skip through this. When we put these constructs into hydrogels, we observe the following. Here is the sensitivity of our sensor versus the number of days in storage. You remember I've been harping on this temporal thing? Time matters. Days in storage. This is the sensitivity. Sensitivity goes up for the 10 millicoulomb per square polyperol device, goes up and goes through some sort of saturation point, we never collected data or beyond, for 1 millicoulomb per square. Suffice it, suffice it to say that going up is not the usual direction. Sensitivity usually goes down. So we were pleasantly surprised that the sensitivity actually went up when we've constructed these devices in hydrogels. So there is some merit to the use of a hydrogel to create the recognition for a device that supports the bio-A bio interface. So we build these discrete devices, we calibrate them, we put them into animals, we bleed out the animals at particular rates to simulate the, the hemorrhage, we send the data by our, um, wireless to our base receiver and collect the data on laptops and we could track the intramuscular, um, not IMTA, but intramuscular uh, lactate levels and we could track the systemic lactate levels. So let me walk you through this plot. This is bleeding time. This is the time that the animal is being bled. So from time T0, the animal is at high blood pressure, normal blood pressure, that's over here. That's green here. The blood pressure is being read here, right, times 10. So that would be 120. And the animal, of course, as it's being bled in time, its blood pressure is falling. As the blood pressure gets to about 40, the animal is considered to be in a state of shock, hemorrhagic shock. But here is what's happening to the systemic blood that's shown in red. So we are withdrawing blood and we are sending it to the lab. This is the circulating blood. This, however, is our sensor that's indwelling in the muscle. The muscle is indicating that the lactate levels have increased long before the systemic circulating blood tells us it has. It takes about 20 minutes for us to see us the first rise in the circulating lactate level, whereas the, the intramuscular lactate level is already quite high. There is a time lag between what goes on in the musculature and what goes on in the systemic, the circulatory system. 
It's in the muscle, you see, that the lactate is being generated. And so there are transport barriers between where it's generated and, and the vasculature. And so our argument then is that we need to put this device in the muscle, where the, the source of where the lactate is being generated. This is my final technical slide. I know you have to go. <laughs> my final technical slide. So this shows what happens under the tongue of a rat that's being hemorrhaged. This is the sublingual circulatory system. Under the tongue, if you, if you go to the mirror and raise your tongue, you'll see a network of vessels. Please try it. You could, this is one of those experiments you could do at home. However, this part of the experiment, which involves bleeding, don't try at home. So when this animal has been bled so that its lactate level is now somewhere between four to nine millimoles per liter, you find that the bed, this bed, becomes less dense. Many of these vessels constrict. You get vasoconstriction. You get very poor circulation. And as a consequence, you have long distances for diffusion from the source of generation of the lactate to the vasculature. And that's what leads to the high lactate levels in the tissue. So our argument is we should do this in the muscle. So we've talked about these materials. We've talked about the polymers being non-cytotoxic. We've talked about the chip. We've talked about the form factor for this device. And we, I hope I've convinced you that you're, you, will be, you will sign up to get one of these implanted, right? Um, but here are some of our challenges. Power. Power is a major challenge for any kind of implantable device. We really need to address this. This needs to be a full court press on developing um, either devices that can be externally powered um, uh, or, or battery systems that can be externally recharged or reducing the power demand on, on analog to digital conversion devices. All of those things have to come into play. Biocompatibility. This problem needs to be solved. We've been at this since the 50s. And the best we can do is indwell a sensor for seven days. The Food and Drug Administration only has a seven-day approval device on the market. So we need to solve this problem. Mixed signal electronics for working with this bio, a bio interface. This, again, is an area that we need to address. Bioactive interfaces, whether it's biomimicry, biosimulation, bio anything, we need to address how to support bio, a bio interfaces because the next great frontier really is taking your, this device inside. The next great frontier is all of this communications device on the inside. And in fact, it's the only way our, our industry will continue to grow. That's my prediction. So we are working with the, um, the Army, Triple Army Medical Research Center in Honolulu to do large animal testing. They've got the large animals and they've got the protocols for um, gunshot wounds and throwing animals off buildings and that sort of thing. So we let them do that. And um, let me invite you to this conference um, in Greenville, South Carolina, beautiful Greenville, South Carolina. Next year, I will chair this conference. Um, these are our slate of plenary speakers and the topics are all the topics that you would find interesting, complex materials, biomimetic materials, um, biotechnical applications of uh, photonic materials, et cetera. So with that, I thank you very much, and I thank you for your attention. Yeah. <laughs>